Are folks still coming in, Tara? No, it looks like they have kind of dried up for now. So I'll go ahead and uh, introduce everyone. Um, hi, welcome everyone to this discussion about how to develop a positive mindset and habits for housebound writers, but I'm sure the intel here will be applicable to writers that can leave their house as well. Um, Nina Amir is our speaker today. Uh, my name is Taryn Edwards and I manage the activities for writers at the Mechanics Institute of San Francisco. And this event has been produced in partnership with the San Francisco Writers Conference and the San Francisco chapter of the Women's National Book Association. Um, these are two entities that I uh, work closely with to provide um, writing classes and other learning experiences uh, relevant to the Bay Area writing community. So, um, so our speaker today is Nina Amir, and I first hosted Nina at the Mechanics Institute, uh, gosh, over eight years ago when she had just published her book, How to Blog a Book. Um, this is the new and improved version. Um, but since then, she has accomplished a ton. Uh, she's a certified high performance coach who works uh, specifically with writers. She's also written some 20 books of her own and is the founder of the Nonfiction Writers University, the Write Nonfiction Challenge uh, that happens in November, and the author of uh, the um, author of Change Transformational Programs. Uh, she's a regular at writers' conferences, including the San Francisco Writers' Conference, and is really one of the uh, most knowledgeable people that I personally know about um, how authors can really ramp up their productivity and their performance and really um, build a viable business around their work. So, um, so pay attention. <laughs> She's got a lot of great content. Uh, for more information, please check out her website, which is easy to remember. It's ninaamir.com. And I typed that into the chat bar so you can um, click from there straight to her webpage. All right, so we have a large audience today. Um, Nina's gonna talk for a few minutes and then we, she and I will have a conversation folding in your questions as we go. So um, uh, write your questions in the chat room. Uh, and then I also wanna introduce Barbara Santos, who uh, is the uh, Director of Marketing for the San Francisco Writers Conference. And she will jump in um, <laughs> as she sees fit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, take it away, Nina. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, so we're going to do a short presentation, um, and then I will open for questions and conversation with Taryn. So here we go. Oops, hold on. There we go. Okay, so I think that most people have, you know, when this pandemic hit, we thought, oh, we're going to have all this time. And everybody kept talking about time. Like, we have so much more time. We'll be able to do all these things. And I think for writers, everyone thought, I'm going to have lots of time to write. Only that wasn't the reality. I think for a lot of writers, they, they got stuck because they were distracted by the pandemic, right? By the news, by how to find toilet paper, by how to find groceries, how to get a mask, you know, how many deaths there were. Plus their kids were home, they were having to homeschool, maybe their spouses were home. Things changed and so did their schedules. And so you may have, real, may have had the same experience that life happened and because life happened, you didn't have time to write. Life got in the way, which is the biggest excuse I usually hear from writers in general, even not during a pandemic. So right now you really have an opportunity to change things up, to reach the next level of your creativity, impact, success, productivity, and fulfillment as a writer, even during a pandemic. And my goal for you really is for you to, to, to realize that this is an opportunity for you to change your habits and your mindsets so that no matter what happens, no matter what life brings your way, you always can write. And it's really about learning to respond to what's happening rather than to just react to it. And that does require some habits and mindsets. So the first 
point I want to make is that you have to remove the only obstacle standing between you and success. One thing stands between you and success in any endeavor, including writing. And I bet some of you know what that is. It's you. You are the only thing standing in the way of your success. Okay, so we have to kind of handle that. And the way we do that is by looking at the habits that are, are hindering your progress as a writer and trying to develop some new habits that will support your uh, efforts to become an author. Okay, so habits include mindsets. The way you think is your mindset, and that is a habitual thing. So your behaviors, your mindsets, these are all habitual, and we want ones that support you, don't, um, don't hinder you. Okay, so typically we hear that, you know, you need to focus on craft and you have to focus on your knowledge of the publishing industry or your niche. And then you have to practice, 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 right? You have to practice your craft, put into practice what you're learning, but nobody really talks about personal development. <laughs> and writers, like anyone, need personal development. This is where you work on habits and uh, and you know your mindsets and your behaviors and that's what leads to success when you add in personal development with craft knowledge and practice you will be a more successful writer and author so I want to I'm gonna talk today about six habits and these six habits came out of the high performance Institute study of the world's highest performers all over the globe they were looking at lots of variables over a hundred variables um, and across all industries and across um, all demographics. So these variables that would help people achieve long-term success and have happy, balanced, fulfilled personal and professional lives, okay? So these six habits are not habits that you would typically think of, okay? I mean, maybe some of them, but they're, they're very unique. And what I wanna do with the rest of our time is to actually spend uh, a few minutes on each habit, okay? So the first habit is to seek clarity. Now for each one of these habits, you're gonna see there's a series of questions. If I was gonna be coaching you one-on-one, -on -one, I'd be asking you powerful questions and clarity in particular relates to powerful questions. You need to ask yourself clarity, uh, questions all the time that give you more clarity. So most, most often we talk about what's your book about? Who's my ideal reader? How can I best serve that reader, right? That's clarity. If you can't tell somebody about your book, you know, in the time it takes to go three floors in an elevator, you know, our elevator pitch, then you don't know what it's about. You don't have clarity. Okay. But beyond that, you need to be thinking about whether you have clarity on what activities move the needle for you. Like, what is it you need to do that will actually move you towards your goals as an author? And beyond that, you need to know what negative thoughts and beliefs, as well as behaviors, are holding you back. Okay, so you have to constantly be developing this habit of looking for increased clarity about your book, about yourself, about your readers, all of that. And so for each one of these habits, I'm going to give you a quick tip. And again, we can talk more about this afterwards. But the tip with seeking clarity is to ask powerful questions. That is how you will develop this particular habit. Okay, so the next, next habit is to generate energy. And this is a, uh, a, an area that is almost never discussed in writing circles, energy. I want you to see yourself as a power plant because a power plant doesn't have energy, it generates energy. And we have lots of different types of energy, mental, emotional, physical, and how much of those do you, and what type, what quality of energy do you bring to your writing daily? There's certain things that are gonna suck your energy, things that are going to lower your energy, things that are gonna raise it. But when you sit down to write every day, you need to generate energy, high energy, positive energy. Now, if, you're, if your mind is stuck on the news, which these days is pretty depression, depressing, right? If you're focused on how many new deaths there were or how many new cases of COVID-19, those types of things, your mental energy which is focused on that, is going to turn into emotional energy, which is going to be um, anxious, fearful, maybe depressed, right? And that's going to lower your physical energy. So these are, are integrally connected, okay? So what do you do about that? You have to figure out what it is, you know, how you're going to generate the energy you need to write, okay? So that could mean that you go exercise, since we know exercise 
raises not only our physical energy, but our emotional and our mental energy. It gives us more clarity, more ability to think. Maybe it's just that you're going to do breathing exercises because the brain needs oxygen, right? And it can't have clarity. It can't have energy if it doesn't have oxygen or water for that matter. Maybe it's that you have to think about something that makes you happier or you need to do something that makes you happier, right? So you want to be thinking all the time, where are my thoughts? What am I feeling? How much energy do I have? And how can I generate the energy that I need to write? Okay, so that's the, the trick there. The tip is to develop a plan to generate more energy or the energy you need. Okay, so the third habit is to increase productivity. Now, this is one talked about a lot. I know all of you are probably interested in how you can be more productive. Here is where actually clarity comes back into play because you have to have some clarity on what your distractions are <clears throat> and also how to eliminate them. Also, you need to know what triggers you to write more effectively, right? And to think back to when were you most productive and how could you replicate that now? And if you're procrastinating, it's probably because you're afraid about something or of something, right? So in order to increase your productivity, my big tip here is really to schedule your writing, okay? A lot of writers just say, I'm going to write when I get a chance, or they have it down, you know, as they're to, on their to-do list to write, but they don't have a block of time scheduled. And what I want you to have is a calendar or a planner where every day you schedule writing in as a block of time as if it was a doctor's appointment. And you don't miss a doctor's appointment because they're gonna charge you for it, right? So it becomes something that you are not going to miss no matter what, okay? Now, sometimes life happens and you can't actually do it, you know, right when you thought you were going to. So maybe then there's an adjustment in the calendar and you make sure that you write for at least 15 minutes so that you never get so far away from your writing. Okay, <clears throat> so we're going to eliminate distractions. We're going to write on a schedule. <clears throat> That's going to increase your productivity a lot. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, now this is a habit that nobody would have thought of. Develop influence. It is actually something you can do habitually to develop influence. Now in the writing and publishing realm, we think about influence as related to platform, right? You want to get out there and have people know, like, and trust you right? But there's so much more to it. First, you have to influence yourself. So we're going to start there. You have to influence yourself because if you're not writing consistently, that's an issue of you not influencing you. Okay. You're in your own way and you're not doing anything about it. You're not trying to look at what your aspirations are and how to reach them. You're not constantly reminding yourself of those aspirations. You're not giving yourself consequences or rewards something's going on there and you're not influencing yourself. And it may be, um, and this is a bigger discussion, but the reason that you're not writing may have to do with your connection to the project, how you really feel about the project. Maybe you have fear. Maybe you don't really want to do it. Maybe you think you should do it. Anyway, you have to clear, get clear on all of that stuff and begin to influence yourself. When you can influence yourself, you can then influence your audience. Okay, and by that I really mean to challenge them in some way, to inspire them to think differently, to become a role model for them. Okay, so even if you're a novelist, you can do these things. You can still have influence with your audience. So my tip here for you is, um, is to commit to doing what you say you're going to do. So influence has a lot to do with, with yourself, has a lot to do with um, congruence and integrity, to do what you say you're going to do. So I'd like you to commit to doing what you say you'll do so you can influence yourself, and um, then you'll be able to influence others. <clears throat> okay, the next uh, habit is to raise necessity. <clears throat> Excuse me, this is habit number five. Raise necessity. I love this habit when it comes to writers. Writers will come to me and say, I'm not writing consistently. And I'll ask them who their audience is. And so I'll give you an example. I had a guy working with me at one point and he was writing a book for parents, actually for fathers. And um, he wasn't writing consistently. And I said to him, who, who needs this book? And he said, the fathers. And I said, well, who's gonna be most impacted by it? And he said, well, the fathers. And I said, well, beyond that, who will be most impacted? He said, the children. And I said, how long can those children wait for this book to come out? 
And he said, they can't wait any longer. They need the better fathers now. That's necessity. You need to know who needs your book now, not in five years. Who's going to be impacted by it? How much time it's going to take you to get it out there? And so that you, you know, if you know they need it now and it's going to take you a nine months to write it, you better get moving, right? And know what will happen, what the consequences are if you don't write it. Those kids, right? They weren't going to get the parents, the fathers they needed if this book didn't get finished. So know what, is it, what it is you need to do right now. What's imperative? What is necessary for you to do. So the tip here for you is to remember why your reader needs your book now. If you keep that in your mind all the time, you will write way more consistently and effectively, I promise you. Okay, the last uh, habit, these are actually high performance habits, um, is to demonstrate courage. And the first thing I want to say about this is that courage is not something you wait for. Most people will say, I'm waiting till I have the courage. Courage is not something you wait for. Courage is bold action. It is the act, you are courageous when you take bold action, okay? So you need to, again, have some clarity here on where do you need more courage? Where are you being held back because of some sort of fear? And how is that fear holding you back? I love these two questions here. What one bold decision do I need to make to help me fulfill my purpose as a writer? Because here's the thing, if you don't have clarity, you can't make a decision. And that decision is what's going to get, move you forward, right? And if you have a sense of purpose or calling or mission about your writing work, then knowing what decision and what action will help you fulfill that purpose is hugely important and hugely motivating. The other question I love is this one. What one bold action will help you 5X your level of success? So if your success is at level two, how are you going to get to level seven? What one thing you, could you do, what bold action could you take that would skyrocket your success? So here in Demonstrate Courage, my tip for you is to take one bold action daily some kind of needle moving activity, okay? That might feel scary to you. All right, so what, we, what I've, I'm just gonna kind of recap a little bit. If you focus on craft, knowledge, and practice, and you add in personal development, you're gonna create new habits and mindsets that are gonna support your writing endeavors. You're gonna reach a higher level of success a lot faster because of you add in personal development. Now, personal development could be reading books about personal growth and habits and mindset and all these kinds of things. It could be working with a coach. It could be being in some kind of group. It could be attending a class. It doesn't really matter, but work on you, okay? Work on you as much as you work on your craft. Because there are a lot of things you can't control in life. We couldn't control this pandemic. Well, you know, we, we're doing our best. We're staying at home, we're sheltering in place, but this COVID-19 was gonna probably show up no matter what we did. Other things in life are just like that. Somebody dies, somebody gets sick, your car breaks down, whatever it is, your, your computer crashes, you can't control it, but you can control yourself. You can control how you respond to these things rather than just react. And when you do that, life will never get in the way of your writing again. And that's when you're going to feel super successful and you're going to make a lot of progress on your projects. Okay. So I know I covered a lot really fast. If anybody is interested, I'm going to stop sharing, Taryn. Um, if anyone is interested in learning more about those habits, there's a book. I'll type it into the chat. It's called High Performance. By Brendan Burchard. You can find out way more about them there, but I'm also happy to answer questions. Karen, back to you. Yeah, you know, one thing I really thought was fascinating was the uh, correlation you made between procrastination and fear. Mm -hmm. I'm a big procrastinator in my writing. Um, <clears throat> and when you said that, I realized maybe I am actually afraid to knuckle down and, and get my project finished. So I'm just sort of reeling over that, that revelation. 
<laughs> yeah. So, you know, people will talk about procrastination a lot. And I always go back to there's something you're afraid of. Either you think that it's going to be too hard or you don't think you'll get the results that you want. Right. Or, you know, that, that, that the, so, so you might have a fear of the outcome. You might have a fear of the process itself. Right. You might, um, for writers, there are a lot of fears that you can throw in there, you know, fears that it's um, not going to be successful, that it'll be rejected, that you'll be judged, that, you know, all kinds of things like that. So, yeah, I really think that we're, we, a procrastination should be just called avoidance because that's what it is. We're avoiding for some reason. And it could even be, as I kind of alluded to, that for whatever reason, this project doesn't excite you anymore. Like sometimes you start something and then, you know, you lose interest and we, we, you know, me, I'm not a quitter. So I usually like, I gotta finish this. Right. Some, sometimes we're procrastinating because we've just lost the passion for it. And that doesn't mean you can't get it back, but yeah, you know, there are just lots of reasons why we procrastinate. Right. So the, the notion of um, how much your psyche really influences your, um, your productivity is, is a little scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so I can't remember the exact numbers, but we, we think something somewhere around about 80,000 thoughts per day. And like 80% of those are subconscious. We're not aware of them. And then some huge percentage, like again, almost like 80%, um, this is the percentage I can't really remember exactly, but are, are negative. So if you're thinking, you know, maybe I don't like this problem, like maybe this project isn't, you know, my thing, like maybe, maybe this was a mistake or maybe I'm not good enough or whatever. These are all going on underneath. Right. And, and, and preventing you from being productive. Now you mentioned um, bold action and Melissa, um, Melissa brings up a question. Uh, she's wondering if you can give an example of, of a bold action or a bold decision that can help you move, move forward and make some progress? Yeah, so, so one would be, um, you know, make a, a decision about how to publish. So a lot of people come to me and they, they say they're gonna self-publish because they actually are just afraid they can't find a literary agent and a publisher, right? And so that's a fear. I'm afraid that I am, you know, don't have the platform or I'm not good enough or whatever to find an agent and a publisher. And so a bold decision there would be, well, first of all, you'd want to get clarity on that. Okay. So I'm afraid of that. Like this is a fear of mine. Right. So then a bold action would be to, well, a decision would be, I'm going to try traditional publishing first anyway. Like I'm just going to go for it and see what happens. Cause I can always self publish like that doesn't go off the table as, a, as an option. And then the next, the, the bold action would be to, you know, maybe write the query letter. If you're writing nonfiction to do the book proposal, or if you're writing fiction to put together the materials you still are going to need for an agent. And then to make a list, a next bold action would be make a list of agents. And then the bigger bold action would be to actually start sending query letters out. Right, right, right. Um, now, you, now let's bring you back to deadlines. Deadlines are kind of, kind of scary to even say. There's the word dead in them. <laughs> um, do, you like do you like to chunk up the tasks in little short um, bits, like make short deadlines for yourself? Or do you recommend like larger goals, bigger goals for um, making bigger goals for a, a larger project? I chunk things down. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm working on a book and, <clears throat> and I do like deadlines, so y'all need to understand that I was, my background is as a magazine journalist. And so <clears throat> um, as a magazine journalist, we, you know, as any kind of journalist, we're always working on deadlines. I also have three blogs. And so I'm always working on deadlines and deadlines are my friend because they make me finish something, right? But if I'm working on a bigger project, like a book project, then I'm definitely going to begin to work back, you know, chunk it down. Okay, so the, the book has 12 chapters. I need to write 12 chapters and I need to be done in six months. So that means I need to write two chapters a month, right? So now I have a two week block. So now I can every day put an amount of time on my calendar to, to work towards that, those smaller goals, right? And it'd be the same when you get to editing or whatever. Does, does that answer your question? 
Yeah, and I think that in this in this book, how to blog a book, you really um, provide some practical practical um, strategies for making deadlines, chunking things up. Mm -hmm. um, so I so I really recommend everyone how to blog a book. Get the second edition; it's great. Um, let's see here now. We have a question from Barbara about clarity. Um, I think she is overwhelmed with, yeah. with social media, with text messages, with phone calls. How do you just sort of like filter all that out and focus? So here's coming from a high performance standpoint. And Barbara, if, that's, if you want to elaborate, you can. I'll answer. And then if you have a follow up. Um, <clears throat> From a high performance standpoint, you need to schedule your day in blocks, okay? So remember everybody, I'm, I'm a writer, I'm an author, I'm an author coach, I'm a high performance coach. So I kind of combine it all, okay? So I want on my calendar to have blocks of time for everything, including email. And what we know about email <laughs> is first of all, if you look at email first thing in the morning, your productivity nosedives, hmm. totally. Do not look at, at your email first thing in the morning, okay? Super hard. Like my team that helps me is in England, so I'm always wanting to look at my email first, but that doesn't serve me. It, email is a convenient organizing system for other people's agendas. I'm going to repeat that. Email. I've never heard it described that way before, but I love it. So right. <laughs> yeah, so I, I would... I'll attribute that to Brendan Burchard because that's where I learned that. But yeah, so your e so email is in a convenient organizing system for other people's agendas, not your own. So the first thing in the morning, your block of time for an hour at least should be your priority projects. Even beyond that, it's what we would call productive quality output. So what is the most important output you have for that day to make your biggest difference or to, to move your project forward. That's what you do first thing in the morning. As for texts, um, you know, number one, you could put, the thing is that distractions are distractions. If your phone is a distraction, then you want to turn off the sound. You want to put it somewhere else, all those kinds of things. Um, I look at texts, I, I'll glance at them. And if it's nothing that I have to deal with right then, then it happens later. You know, this morning I was editing um, my current work in project and, um, and my daughter started texting, but I looked to see who it was and I saw that it was her and she was having some kind of an allergic reaction. So of course I responded, but if she was just telling me she baked another loaf of bread in her many <laughs> her long stream of bread baking during the pandemic, you know, I would have just, I would have just not done anything with it. So I don't know, Barbara, is that, does that answer your question? off in a different direction than I was headed, but I really like the answer. <laughs> my, my problem is clarity that I like one-on-one -on -one and I really am feeling pain that I can't talk with folks one-on-one face-to-face. -on -one -face. And so for, for instance, the other day I showed up at my son's house. I'm sorry, I did. And he was at my house <clears throat> to do something. And, um, I just, one of the things I've, I, I'm scheduled to do another Zoom session with um, Carson Tate. She wrote um, Work Simply, and it shows people how the way they work um, helps with their, what they produce. Everybody approaches a problem differently. Do you, do you know Carson Tate? Or I know. That, I really recommend the book because it helped me a lot. Um, you know, some people are visual, some people um, need to write it down, whatever. Uh, it it's just helps understand how you work. So you don't feel guilty that you're not doing it like someone else is doing it. Right, and that, so that, that is a point of clarity. So you have to figure out how you work best. So there right. are people who will say to me, I cannot write first thing in the morning. Like, that's just not going to happen for me. Now, I used to think that about myself, too. And now, first thing in the morning is when I, when I write. <clears throat> now, you have to play around. Everybody has different biological rhythms. 
right? Some of us work better in the afternoon or late at night and you have to work with that, but you also have to create a system. And I don't know what Carson is saying about that, but for me, my system is my, my planner. So I live by, let's see if I can grab it here. I've used all kinds of planners, by the way, but I live by a planner. Like it's blocked out and highlighted. You know, it's color coded by who's a client and when it, the green is my time to work on my projects. And, you know, so I live by this. It has a list of to do items for every week, you know, and I just, and, and it's interesting because my, my son thinks I'm so organized and, and all that, and that looks organized, but if I didn't have that, I wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? So that's what works for me. It may not work for someone else. Although I, I'm a firm believer that if you get yourself some kind of a scheduler and you put your writing on it and you put the other things like email and make dinner and go grocery shopping and, you know, walk the dog. If all of that's on there, you will, you will tend to stick to those blocks of time better. You may not make it right on the dot. Sometimes I'm working on something and don't want to stop. I admit it, you know, but then my schedule gets off, but it keeps, you'll get more, way more done. You'll be way more productive, but you do, Barbara, have to get clarity on your own system. You epitomize, ask a busy person if you want something done. I mean, how, how you do everything you do is amazing. And people say, I'm too busy to write a book. Yeah, look at that planner. Yeah, I'm super busy. And there are days when the writing is a small part of my day. It is. I mean, if I have other deadlines, other, you know, fires to put out, then that, that happens, you know, but the, but I try to make sure the writing's happening at all times. And, and if it's not, it's a conscious decision. Today, this other thing takes precedent. I have to get this done today. You know, I have to prepare for the Mechanics Institute. So, you know, writing is only 15 minutes or I'll make up the time tomorrow or, but without some kind of to-do list and schedule, I think it's super hard to be productive. Do you have different areas in your house for different things that you do? Like I do my writing over here. I do my clients over here. No. no. Uh, I have a room all the way at the top of the house that is kind of my meditation room. And once in a while, I'll go there with my computer. Um, I will write outside occasionally. If I'm not feeling creative, like if I'm feeling stuck and my writing's not happening, then, or I feel like I need to change a venue, I'll either go outside if the weather is nice and sit on the deck, or I have a comfy chair in the living room that looks out towards the redwoods and stuff. And so I will change my venue as I feel necessary, but mostly I'm right here at this desk. Um, the only thing that changes is the desk goes up and the desk goes down. So it's Ooh, a, right now I'm nice. standing. <laughs> So um, all my client sessions are done standing and that goes back to generating energy. So like this, all presentations, every time I'm coaching, teaching something, training in some sort of a presentation, I stand because there's a huge difference in your energy than when you sit. When you sit, your energy drops. And so I, I do go up and down all, during the day. <laughs> Other than that, I'm right here. Yeah, yeah. Hey, you know, I just want to announce to the guests that please ask questions in the chest in the chat room, and um, we'll fold them into the conversation. Um, we next have a we next have a question from Hamilton, who wants to know how to how to keep motivated when you're writing something that isn't necessarily going to be published because you don't have that deadline, right? right. You don't have that motivator. <laughs> <laughs> right. So Hamilton, what I would say is you have to get clear on why, why you're writing it. So this comes back to purpose. And there are writers who will say, I write because I must. Like, that's just who I am. I'm a writer. That's how I process things. So, okay, fine. So then that's, that's why you write is to process and to do, you do it for yourself. Okay. But know that, be very clear. I do this for myself. I think the majority of writers write to be read, to have impact, to make a difference in their, their readers' lives. And so if, if ultimately that's your goal, you have to get clear on that purpose. So I would just ask yourself, Hamilton, why you're writing, why you don't want to share it with the world. Um, 
whether that has to do with fear or whether you just really do it for yourself. And if you do it for yourself, then that's fine. But if you're trying to finish, I see in the chat, a long book and you're not going to publish it, my question would be why? Like, why, why are you writing a long book that you're not going to publish? Can we hear from Hamilton? Yeah, we could. Hamilton, you want to talk? I'm unmuting you. <laughs> are you there, Hamilton? Yes. Why are you writing this long book if you're not going to publish it? Mm, I don't. I can't. Huh. Um, can I can't you? hear you, Hamilton. You have to move closer to the computer. Sometimes when I draw, the story just comes. Okay, so you like telling stories, so that's awesome. So that's a reason to, to write your book. But if do you not ever think you'd want to tell these stories to someone? I do all the time to my family. Okay, so you have a you. There are different types of storytellers. There are storytellers who put them into books, and there are storytellers who write them down and then share them orally, they just speak them. Our best storytellers are storytellers who get up in front of groups and actually, or, or even one-on-one -on -one and tell their stories. So maybe you're putting them down on paper so that you can just remember them and tell them to others. No? Um, <laughs> let's see, uh, let's move on to, uh, you mentioned something about um, uh, meditating. Do you do that? regularly as part of your writing practice? Yeah, so I get up in the morning and um, it's taken me a long time to get kind of a morning routine going. You know, I've read, any, if you read anything in personal development, you're gonna hear about a morning routine and having, um, you know, taking time in the morning to meditate and journal and all of that. And I've been a critic of um, morning pages because people come to me, writers come to me and tell me they have no time. And I'm getting to the meditation thing a little bit roundabout, but they will come to me and say, I don't have time to write, but they're spending an hour doing morning pages, you know, like from the artist's way. And so I was sort of, I was always like, you know, just write, like if you need to write for 15 minutes in a journal, fine, then just get back down to your writing. So. But then I read all these books about people getting up at 5 a.m. and you know doing meditating and journaling and having this whole routine before they would begin their day. And it took me a long time to get into some sort of a habit and I'm still developing it, Taryn. But yes, in the morning I meditate for at least 10 minutes. And if I have time during the day, if I feel really scattered or stressed, then I'll stop again and meditate. And one of the things we do in high performance, and you guys, I, I'll see if I can get the link, but you can easily find it. Brendan Burchard has a meditation called the release meditation. And I think, I, don't, I recommend this all the time for writers because what happens is we, our brains get, you know, like we have a lot going on in our heads all the time. And so sometimes you just need to let stuff go. And all this meditation is, you don't even have to look at the video, but he has a, a video of this, of the release meditation. And all you do is repeat the word release, 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 like a mantra. Mm. And it just, and the, with the goal of just, yeah, it's just the goal of letting things go, releasing whatever is going on for you. I'm writing that down. <laughs> yeah, and just go online and look for Brendan Burchard release meditation. He does it for 20 minutes. But we, what we teach in high performance coaching is that you can do it for two minutes. Two minutes is all you need and you will feel different. So, so to answer your question, Taryn, I do have a meditation practice. I am still practicing, as most meditators do, but I'm also still really um, learning to, 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 to do it consistently. Okay. Because, Did because we answer I, Melissa's question about um, an example of a bold decision to move forward? Did I miss that? I did. I talked about oh. deciding to publish. Oh. Yeah. A smaller, but we can go back to that. A smaller bold decision might be to actually write something like you have in your head that you're going to write a personal essay that is actually very personal, like feels vulnerable, right? And to sit down, to decide to write that today, that would be a bold decision. 
you know, to, 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 and then to actually do it, to not just say you've decided, but to actually do it. As Tony Robbins says, um, our, our destiny um, is made up of decisions. So we, we make, so it's, it's in our decisions, I think is the way he says it, in our decision is, is, our, is how we build our destiny. So you make that decision and then you take massive action towards it. So anyway. That's great. Now you have a lot of books that you've written. Is there one that kind of touches on some of the content that you have here presented us today that you can recommend um, for our audience to follow up with? Um, if you go to ninaamir.com, there is an ebook uh, that you can download. It's just a PDF ebook, but there's one 20, um, uh, 20 high performance habits. You can, uh, I can't remember the exact title that you can start today. Mm -hmm. And, um, that goes into some of this, but there, there are a bunch of blog posts on my blog at ninaamir.com about high performance habits. And on, on the other blog, right? Nonfictionnow.com. Um, I have actually talked about high performance habits for writers, but um, training manual has a whole chapter that is personal development oriented, you know, mm -hmm. talks about um, author attitude and things like that. But the only book I have to date is the, the ebook that um, the ebook that is on ninaamir.com. And that does put you on my mailing list. So I'll just be transparent. It puts you on the mailing list for personal development and spiritual development. So ninaamir.com, that site, that, blog is all personal and spiritual growth. Um, if you want to be on my nonfiction writing mailing list, you'd have to go over to writenonfictionnow.com. But there are posts there about habits for sure. Yeah, uh, you have so much content that it's fun just to wade through what you have <laughs> yeah. and see how it applies to whatever problem one's suffering. <laughs> yeah. Now, Rick has a comment. He um, he says that he has to enjoy his writing sessions. Uh, and I guess one way he likes to avoid the pain is to make things fun by creating lists and snippets of dialogue um, and editing and outlining. Does that all count towards one's writing time? Um, yes and no. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Some of this is necessary, right? We have to edit. We might need to make lists of things, you know, that we need to do. Um, we, you know, we need to outline. These are all things we need to do. So it counts, but it's not the actual writing. Writing dialogue, yes, that for sure would be, be writing. Um, it always brings me back, and I can't remember who said, I, I don't have the quote correct, and I don't remember, I might have been Steinbeck. I can't, maybe one of somebody else will remember, but he said, you know, I, every day I wait for something like every day I wait for inspiration to hit. Luckily it hits at 9 a.m. when I sit down in my chair or something <laughs> along those lines and totally massacring that quote. And so I think, at least for me, it's one of those things where writing is writing. Like people say, are you writing a book right now? Yeah, I'm writing a book, but mostly I'm edit at this point, I'm mostly editing and revising and cutting. So is it actual writing? No, when I sit down to write a blog post, that's writing. So because the other thing you have to remember is your brain works differently doing different tasks. When you write, you um, really need to push out your inner critic and you have to um, just allow things to come out onto paper. That's why I love timed writing. It's like setting a clock for 30, you know, a timer for 30 minutes and writing as fast as you can for 30 minutes because then all you do is you let things come out and onto paper. That's writing. And you want to do that without that inner voice that's constantly saying, could that sentence be better? What was, you know, is it a better word? Oh, I need some research here. You want that out of the way. When you're editing and revising, that's when you want to invite in your inner critic who's going to say that sentence needs to be better. And oh, that was the wrong word. And by the way, you needed research here. Let's go get it. But research is also a different set of skills. And so I like to put research into another time block as well, if possible. Now, sometimes you have to, um, sometimes you have to do research as you're writing because you can't keep going. But the, and I'm sorry for the dinging as to Barbara's question. Somebody's texting me and I'm not looking at them. 
but I don't know how to make <laughs> the noise go away. It's turned off. <laughs> um, but yes, what I like to do is actually for research to put brackets and just say research here. Mm. And then, then go through and do a search for the word research and you'll find it. And during one block of time, you go do that research. And then you could write that section or whatever. But um, most everything you do that isn't straight writing is actually um, asking your brain to do something different. It's using a different part of your brain. And so it's best to just write when you're writing and say, okay. and if you can't write, then you, you know, if you're stuck, then maybe do something like writing a list or whatever, just to get yourself going. And I have clients who will tell me they've done that. Oh, I did an outline or I made a list and that got me more excited. But, but writing isn't always fun, Rick. That's the thing. Like it, it's hard work. <laughs> a huge fallacy a myth that writing is fun sometimes it's fun and sometimes it's really difficult <laughs> so, anyway That's one great. of your um slides says something about influence yourself can you elaborate my job is to influence other people that's how i see it how do you influence yourself so in a lot of the same ways that you influence others, one is to really get clear on your aspirations. Like what is it you want to achieve? And when you know that, then you can keep uh, kind of asking yourself what will get you there. So that's one thing. It's sort of a typical, I want this, I want to achieve this goal and I have to do these things to get there. And so I'm going to, you know, it's going to feel good when I get to the goal. Right. And so that motivates us. Um, another is really just, you can really get down to just goals, um, to um, consequences and rewards. I mean, like little kids, right? How do we motivate kids? We, you know, we, we actually say, well, if you do X, you get this, which is something they want. So you can res resort to that. But when you're influencing other people, Barbara, um, it's really about uh, persuasion techniques, right? So in high performance, we talk a lot about really knowing what the other person's aspiration is and then trying to tie into that. So you want the X and they want Y and you have to get them to realize that if they do X, it helps them get to Y or that you can help them get to Y. Does that make sense? You get them kind of on board with you because it's helping them get where they want to go. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> So you have to do the same kind of thing for yourself. It's like, how do I get me on board to get to here? Like maybe there's something you need to do that you don't really want to do, which sometimes people say they want to write and they don't want to write, but maybe you have something else you need to do that you don't really want to do. And so you have to say, well, if I do that, it helps me achieve this other thing that I really do want. And that moves you along. Does that make any sense? Yeah, so the, the, uh, the carrot for me is not that I get a reward after I finished X number of pages. It's I, I need it to get me to the paper to even write those pages. Okay, so sometimes we have to think about how we feel when we're done with the pages. Um, but I really think it's about getting clear on what it is you want to accomplish. And when you have the clarity of what you want to accomplish, you can make a decision about how to do things differently. So your habit is that you don't do what you say you want to do or what you need to do to achieve the goal. That's a habit. So you have to just change the habit. So like for me, I was always writing late in the day. And my, my reasoning was when I get everything else handled, my mind is clear and I can write. But then everything else would take all day and I wouldn't write. So mm -hmm. I have to shift it. Now, do I, did I want to write first thing in the morning? No. And for about a year, I would get out of bed, sometimes still in my pajamas, grab some water, wouldn't even make tea. And I would go to my desk and I would turn on the computer and I would write. I made a decision and I followed it with action. So this is where the habits come in. So we started out talking about habits and mindsets, right? So habits, you have to develop a habit and that habit is going to take anywhere from 40 days to over 200. No, really? 
Yep, the studies show everybody used to say 30 days to a habit. Now, the shortest time period tends to be about 40 days, and there are people who it takes like 220 days to develop a solid habit. So you basically have to just do it over and over again. But that's that clarity of I want to do this. So now I'm going to change, you know, I'm going to change my thinking about it. I'm going to change how I behave. I'm going to change my routines. I'm going to do something differently. And sometimes that's the bold action because we're afraid that the process will be hard. We're afraid that we, we won't get the outcome we want, right? Mm -hmm. We're yeah. afraid that we might lose something in the process. Yeah. Mm. Right? That we might lose our freedom or we might lose our mornings or whatever it is. And so really what it comes down to, Barbara, is to, to, to get really clear on why you want to do whatever it is you say you're going to do or why you have to do it. Necessity, increase the necessity. Increasing necessity makes a huge difference in almost anything like this because if you feel like you really have to do it, you're going to do it. I know you. I know you. You get a lot of stuff done. And I know you do it because you have deadlines and things have to get done. And so you do it. You have a high degree of necessity. So change the degree of necessity. If you're wanting to write every day and you're not doing it, then your, your degree of necessity is too low. I love that. Now, I don't want to take up time from everyone else. We're almost out of time. So does everyone know how to get into the chat room to ask questions? Um, it's down at the bottom uh, menu bar and it says chat and you just click it and you can write a question for Nina. Um, Karen, can they unmute themselves and ask a question? They can. Is that okay with you? It's okay. I can let, I can let go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'd love to, I'd love to answer some more questions. If you either type them in or you can unmute or there's a way to raise your hand. Too. Taryn, do you know that? There's a way they can yeah, raise Yeah, the hand's so small. Rick has said he's a believer in prompting the subconscious, and he likes to end each writing session with a, um, with a saying, tomorrow I'll find an end to this chapter. I'll find a way to write it, or some sort of note like that, some sort of note that spurs the subconscious to write next time. Yeah, I think that's great, Rick. I love that suggestion. And, um, you know, my, my last book was Creative Visualization for Writers. And I'm a huge advocate of visualizing. So just visual, you know, that's a great affirmation. Tomorrow I'll find a way to end the chapter. Um, but you can also visualize that happening. And, you know, we know from, um, from professional athletes that visualization, um, the body doesn't know the difference. Like the mind, the mind doesn't know the difference between a visualization and what's actually happening. So when an athlete visualizes crossing the finish line of a race, let's say like a marathon, the as they visualize it, the body's, the mind is triggering all the muscles just as if they were running across the finish line. And so, so that just reminds me of that, that we can, we can definitely get in the habit of visualizing uh, ourselves writing easily and effortlessly and effectively, productively, finishing our projects, getting them published, all those things. And that helps enormously. Affirmations are good too, which is really what that is. It's a kind of affirmation. Well, I just put the link to uh, creative visualization for writers um, in the chat room. I used Amazon, um, so sorry, just to link you to the link you to the ISBN number. You can buy it at lo your local bookstore. In fact, please do that. Um, but uh, but there it is. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. Other questions? Feel free to unmute, or if you have a specific problem, like you're struggling and you know you're homebound right now during the pandemic, and you're struggling because your kids are home or you're struggling, you know, whatever is challenging you, I'm happy to, to kind of coach you on that as well and give you some suggestions. You know, I noticed just clicking through the names that a lot of the folks that are listening are members of the writers groups that we have at Mechanics Institute. And I was just wondering um, how you feel about, how do you feel about writers groups? Do you find them to be uh, helpful or do they kind of take away a little bit from your process? Depends what the writer's group is. Um, is it a writer's group like they come together and they write together or is it a writer's group like they're critiquing each other's work or? 
Yeah, it's tending towards the latter, but we do have drop-in drop in writers groups that just work off prompts together. But um, I, personally, I've had, I've joined writers groups and I've stuck with them for a little while, but then I just kind of get bogged down and I feel like I'm writing for them. I'm not necessarily writing for, for my own goals or for my reader so much. I'm kind of, I guess, um, acquiescing to the schedule of the writers group. Right. So writers groups can be time consuming, number one. So for the writer who says they don't have time to write, a writers group can sometimes take away from their writing time. They also can be um, disheartening because if the, if the critic, you know, the, the feedback they're getting is not good, then it, of course they need to hear that, but that can be, can be uh, set them back. Um, I think that writers groups are the best when there are, there's a range of people in them in terms of uh, ability. Like you might have some beginners, but you have some people who are intermediate writers. You have some people who are published. You have some people who are very successfully published because then you have a good exchange of ideas going on, right? And you're not just all beginners together and don't know anything. The other thing about a writer's group is I really feel like they need to be uh, people in the same or similar niches. And by that, I mean, if you're writing romance and everyone in your writer's group is writing mystery or thriller or nonfiction, you're not going to get the feedback that you really need, right? Because they're not going to understand what you're really writing. So you want to be, you know, I, I would prefer to see writer's groups that are like all nonfiction and maybe it's, you know, there's memoir group and then there's a, you know, how to prescriptive type kind of straight nonfiction group. And then you have your novelists who are writing, you know, literary stuff. And then you have, you know, your not, you know, then you have, may have, maybe have your romance writers, right? And then you have your thriller writers because these books are very different. And unless people are reading those books all the time, they're going to have a, and writing them, they're going to have a hard time giving you feedback that really is useful. Does that make sense? Uh, no, absolutely. And it's, it's almost as if a writer's group kind of functions as a, as a mentor Yes. Mentorship process rather than helping, helping the writer grow uh, intellectually rather than necessarily improving their writing so much. Right. Right. And, and I've heard some great stories at conferences, like keynote speakers talking about who's in their writer's group, you know, and they don't necessarily always meet together, but you know, they're like other really successful writers. Right? I mean, there was one guy, I can't remember who it was now, talked about how every week he would meet with this other writer in the sauna. You know, they, they would swim. I think they would swim in the bay, actually. They would swim in the bay and then they would go in the sauna and they would talk about their works in, project, in, in progress. And they mentored each other and they were able to knock around ideas and all of that. And so, you know, that to me, that's a, that's a wonderful relationship to have is somebody who can, can really relate and boost boost you up and um, help you knock around your ideas. I think that's really what you're looking for. Right. Well, maybe it all comes out when you're sitting together naked with just a towel on. I guess so, yeah. <laughs> After swimming in the frigid waters of the bay. <laughs> this is true. It's a true story. <laughs> all right. Well, um, we just have one last comment from Hamilton who says, Hamilton Sr., who says some of his best writing experiences have been with writers groups um, that meet to encourage writing and discuss their individual projects. And he thinks it's a great way to keep people motivated and supported. And I just want to say, in relation to that, that um, Mechanics Institute, prior to the shelter in place, had 13 writers groups um, active. Most of them are critique groups. Uh, there were two drop in writing groups. And um, so after the shelter in place lifts, we hope to you know, maintain that vibe. Um, and if anyone is interested, we do have a virtual drop-in writing group that happens on Thursdays between 11 and one. So it kind of clashes with these uh, Thursday um, talks that we've been hosting, but I'll put the link to that uh, to next week's session in the chat room. 
Yeah, and I want to just say also that, that the, like, it sounds like your drop-in writing groups are actually writing. I did virtual writing groups for a long time. And I meant to say this when you asked about, um, about meditation. So something that was super successful. So we would get together in a Zoom room. Well, first we did it by tele teleseminar. Then we did it by Zoom. And the nice thing about Zoom is when everybody's right, like you don't turn off your video. Like you're all writing. Mm -hmm. Nobody's talking. You're just writing but you can see each other, which is really inspiring to see other people working with you. Mm -hmm. and there's an accountability to that, so stay at your desk and keep working. But what we would do, to go back to the meditation, um, Taryn, was we would do a process that, again, came out of high performance for me, but we would do a, um, a meditation. We would uh, do a breathing exercise to, so meditation to kind of let go of all the thoughts going on and get you really present and ready to write. Then we would do a, um, a breathing exercise to raise your energy up and give your brain what it, and body what they need to focus and be productive. Um, and then we would set an intention. So three parts, meditate and let things go, get really centered and present, then, um, then do some kind of breathing or something to raise your physical energy and give your brain oxygen and then set an intention for the writing period. So if you're gonna write for an hour, what is it you're going to accomplish in that time? What's your intention? And that worked super, super well. So I, I really think the, the writing groups are amazingly helpful. And I'm not against the, the critique groups at all. You know, I think they're great. I think the fact that the Mechanics Institute has so many is super. This, like I said, just mean, it makes sure, kind of like you were saying, Taryn, that they, after a while, you didn't feel <clears throat> like it was do, you know, serving you just make sure that the, the group is, is serving your needs. Yes, uh, there's so many of them, it's hard to keep track. <laughs> but um, all right, well, you know, it looks like the questions have kind of dried up for now, but I'm sure that they, people will uh, digest all this material that you've given them and probably reach out to you or to me with, um, with further questions. Um, so I want to thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. I um, am eager to start putting some of your uh, advice in, into practice. And um, I also want to announce the uh, conversation that uh, Barbara and I will be having next week uh, with Anna Bullard from the Bookshop of West Portal. So I put the link in the chat. And Nina has also updated her uh, email address and her two websites, her two blogs, um, if you'd like to find out more material um, that she's hiding there. Um, and uh, then, of course, ninaamir.com has a wealth of e resources, uh, articles, and ebooks that Nina has published over the years. And I just want to plug this one more time how to blog a book. <laughs> I've, I've purchased it twice. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> First edition and second edition? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And don't forget the author training manual. The author training That's manual. That's very good too. Really, uh, <laughs> to me, it was the best book I wrote in terms of really, con I mean, how to blog a book was great. It was a new concept. People weren't really talking about it. I mean, it was happening. People were getting blog to book deals, which is what sparked that. But the author training manual, I think is a it's sort of a foundational text if you want to become a successful writer and author. So, but thank you for plugging them. I appreciate it. <laughs> and I hope it was okay. I put my contact info in there. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Nina. And I look forward to seeing you in real time. Yes. Uh, shelter in place uh, lifts. And thank you all for coming today. We've had a really, uh, really exciting conversation, I think. And I, and I love the networking on the side here. Everybody's talking with each other. It's lovely. <laughs> Keep doing it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I hope it was helpful. It was. Yeah. All right. Cheers. Have a good we'll rest see of the you afternoon. All next Thursday. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Thanks, Bye. 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 Welcome, Hamilton. <laughs> Both Hamiltons. Thank you. <laughs>